and I see you in the corner, you kind of, you know, if y'all don't know, Jeff's a fly dude, man. He, he, <laughs> he's sitting here real cool, you know, but Jeff's fly, man. Uh, Jeff was fly even when he had the dreads, too. I don't think this is smooth. I was flyer, yeah. actually. This, this is the yeah. real smooth, elevated, you know, cigar sip. The, you the know, five smoking. kids, yeah. the five yeah, the kids, five. Jeff. <laughs> y'all we got another episode of world's greatest game um and this is a special one this this is real special because um man my brother pulled up yes sir so we got we got the legendary jeff johnson the renaissance man (laughs) the real future um he got us doing something a little different today um we had a great dinner indeed Um, he tolerated my cooking, so I appreciate um, you for doing that. There we um, go. We starting off with lies, and and now we we're on cigar number two. We've had some great wines. We have uh, a nice Zacapa twenty three, and like you always do, man, you elevate me, um, and that's the theme, I think, for mm. this, and what I feel is is about elevation. Uh, and you know this is always we don't we don't prep this is conversation Mm -hmm. but i am gonna try to interview my teacher (laughs) um in a way but but in all seriousness um jeff thank you one for for flying in coming hot off the plane i know your schedule i know how you work i know how much time you spend with your family and um and how much I look up to you and how you force the conversations. And so mm-hmm. I'm going to do, I'm going to attempt to do what you do with me all the time, which is push my thinking. Mm. Uh, and so everyone watching is in for a treat because part of what we're doing here is bringing people behind the curtain on the conversations that we have on a normal basis yeah. and how we groom each other in ways. Um, but this is specifically about how you have helped groom and shape me. And I want to pay that forward to a lot of other folks to get a lot of your story about mm. and, and get that out and how you've become who you are. Um, and you've had, you have an, an, an impeccable and remarkable just journey, uh, across many things that you've mastered, uh, but you constantly are growing, um, evolving, and and pushing those around you to do the same. You are incredibly selfless with your relationships and connections, but with your time and your intellect. Hmm. And I'm going to try to do this justice <laughs> today. But I would be a liar if I didn't say I was almost a bit nervous. Oh, man. And and I've I've been on your I've been on your shows, I've been fortunate enough to have some amazing conversations with you and, and a and a group of incredible brothers that you have connected, um, you know on a regular basis. We've fallen off a little bit. We're gonna get back on track. We're gonna get to that. It's a lot but of life happening. It's a lot of life happening. But you know, Jeff, before we go too deep, I I can never give the um, the bio that you do on others your intro is <laughs> is too much so i'm not even going to attempt that i would actually love for you to give your bio huh. and you go through it and i'm going to make sure you do it in the way and how you introduce oh, other folks and man. just for anybody that's watching if jeff ever introduces you to a room it's going to take your breath away you're going to have a hard time following what he does so I want you to give your intro to you because I don't think you've ever been asked to do that. No, I haven't. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I don't even know if I can. I mean, and, 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 and one, thank you. Thank, thank you for, man, thank, thank you for your friendship um, and, and the brotherhood. And, and, and it's funny, I, I, this is probably the first time I've seen you where I've been 
less excited to see you. Because <laughs> I just wanted to see Kennedy. Like, if I'm honest. And that's what happens when you become a father, right? Absolutely. Nobody comes through to see you. No. Um, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon excited uh, about you being a father. And, and, and I told you, it's like, there aren't a lot of men that I know that, that I think they have, they have all of the gifts already of what makes a great dad a great dad before they have kids. <laughs> and, and the thing is that, that, that Kennedy is actually going to cure you <laughs> <laughs> of, of some of the things that, that you need to be cured of at this time. But, but, but uh, you know, my introductions are about the excitement I have about the genius of brothers. Yeah. And so I, I introduce brothers through the lens of my excitement of their brilliance. I don't know if I can do that for me because um, I know how brilliant I'm not mm. in ways that I don't know about other brothers. And so, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, I am UK born, Cleveland raised, uh, citizen of Baltimore for the last 20 years. I'm a crib to college dad of five. Big up to Madison Miles, Malcolm Baldwin, and Woo! Garvey. Talk. Uh, I am the honored and sometimes undeserving husband of of Jacqueline Aviel. Jacqueline, and, thank you um, for allowing him to come out here. <laughs> um, I have to appreciate that. So thank and, you. And <laughs> and um, I'm a servant um, who has had a really interesting career. Yeah. In being a professional activist, an entrepreneur um, in the political space, an entrepreneur in the comm space, an entrepreneur now in the impact space who has simultaneously had this parallel bootleg career where for the last 13 years I've been on syndicated radio every week on the Tom Joyner and Ricky Smiley morning shows at 13 year run at BT as a host and producer and commentator. And, um, but more than anything else, I, I have a passion for black men. Yeah. Um, and I want to, I, I recognize clearly that our communities will forever be impacted by how healthy our men are. And, and, and that's not a statement that uh, removes our sisters from the equation. Mm -hmm. It's just that I don't often see us aggressively loving us. Yeah. And that's, that is the mission and purpose for which I currently exist. So what, what I love is you give these statements um, with so much clarity and confidence but that comes through the work. Yeah. And and part of part of what what world's greatest game is about, right? Is is yes about self-mastery. But the mastery component of it is the end, right? The journey is 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 the magic. And so as we we go back, right? You you are a college athlete, right? You college athlete in Ohio. Yeah. Um, but you don't just settle for being a college athlete. You become the first school president. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I went to the University of Toledo, um, which for, for those that don't know, was about 25,000 students at the time when I was there. And, um, and what's interesting, I mean, I, I was a black student union president. So I, I, went, to, I went to University of Toledo on a, on a track scholarship which was really like my first love. Yeah. I, I wanted to go to the 96 Olympics. I felt like I could probably compete in the long jump. That was my, my best event. I ran the one, the two, the long, and the triple. Okay. Went to University of Toledo on a track scholarship and realized that, like many, I think, college athletes realize, even in a non-revenue sport, yeah. right, that – there's not a whole lot of interest in you being a whole person. And, and my wow. coach and I beefed because he was like, listen, I brought you here to run track and go to class. And I'm like, dog, this is track. Like, this is, this is 
This is track in a Mac school. Like this is like, <laughs> nigga, come on. And and so so I'm like, you know. And and I and I had a very different experience in high school. I mean, I, I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland, Cleveland Heights High School, and uh, I ran track. I did mock trial. I did speech and debate. I, you know, was active in my church. I, I, I was I was raised to be a whole kid. Yeah, yeah. So there was no way I was coming to the University of Toledo and and you were gonna make me a body. Like, to hell with you. Um, and so I didn't do well on the track team and I became black student union president and we were like, we were scary. Like yeah. black kids were afraid of us <laughs> at the university of Toledo. We, we brought Farrakhan to campus when that wow. was just a thing that, that, that was beginning to happen, but, yeah. but, but didn't happen very often. It was I got my first death threat. And, um, what was interesting for me was I'm like, y'all motherfuckers this mad about a dude coming to speak on campus? And um, to, to the degree that I got, um, they put a note on my door of my apartment. Wow. Like, nigga, we know where you live. And um, I created a very amazing relationship with the nation because Minister Charles Muhammad, who was the minister of the mosque in Toledo, put Fruit of Islam on my door in my apartment. Wow. Um, and so it was, a, it was a really interesting time. We led a march to the, to the home of the president um, uh, around demands. And, and, and I mentioned that because it, w- it was the first time that I recognized you didn't have to have a whole lot of money. You didn't have to have some fancy title mm. to be able to create institutional change. And we were able to change the transportation systems at the university to go into the hood to pick up students when before they didn't have routes through the hood. We ensured that there was a student and a member of black faculty and staff on every search committee, um, executive search committee, so no longer they could say we couldn't find any black candidate. Like, you think about that in 1993. This is some of the shit we're dealing with right now when you start talking about talent and corporate executives saying, we don't know where black talent is. Um, And and so those were things that happened. And so to be elected the first black president and and was crazy Keenan to this day, the only person of color to be president of student government at the University of Toledo. So so to be a scary ass black student union president for two terms yeah. and then be elected president cuz you know no, you know the what normally you it know what even, normally happens absolutely what normally happens is it's the safe dude it's absolutely. the safe black dude Always. who's a member of a white frat uh he don't scare nobody who becomes the first black straddle the line yeah, for everybody yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And, and and we're not going to say how black somebody is or not but that's normally the dude <laughs> right it's the obama on campus yeah and and I was not that dude. Wow. And but what was, what was crazy, and what was so it was such a learning experience for me was black students got pissed at me because I ran with a white girl. Hmm. Well, Keenan, they had I actually ele- didn't know that they they hadn't elected one of us. <laughs> they was gonna elect two, like so <laughs> I wasn't gonna run with Akbar. <laughs> It's like I ran with Molly. Literally, I ran with Molly. Like Molly was my running mate's name, and she was Shout out to an Molly. amazing. Oh, Molly Horman, I love you wherever yeah. you are. I'm sure she's doing something amazing. Because what was dope was Molly ended up being my ambassador. Okay. And she would walk me into these Greek frat houses and these white organizations and say, and she would tell them what the mission of the Black Student Union was. And she would say, Jeff was the leader of the Black Student Union, and this was their mission. And some of you all got mad at Jeff aggressively walking out the mission of the Black Student Union. So if he did that for them, what do you think he's going to do for you? Flipped it. <laughs> Flipped it on him. And, and, oh, we, Molly's and, cold. and, Molly's cold. and we got a, and I got elected. And, and, and what it said for me was that you don't have to not be yourself to lead yeah so that was uh i don't normally talk about that i mean no no nobody ever normally to ask me about college 
Um, but it was it was profound for me in a lot of ways because it also was an opportunity to remind me I really wanted to serve my people. Yeah. I, and I, not just lead. I get excited about your college story because, one, yes, being being the first, but I think there's so many layers to it. Um, hearing of Molly, which this is the first time. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is incredible. Molly and Steve Hartman. Because I've, I've heard about Steve, and I, and I think, you know, one of the stories that I'd, I'd love for you to just share and, and recount again as you were getting ready to run and, and things were being placed on the ground yeah. getting ready. So <laughs> I, I don't want to leak, but I, I would love for you to just touch on, on that story as well and just the context of what was going on because I think it was, it was so impactful. Right yeah, I mean, and, and like I said, I mean, we, we were aggressive. We were an aggressive black student union, so we said a lot. And, you know, like now where you've got folks that decide to start doing things and then people start bringing up old tweets, <laughs> we didn't have social media yeah. at that time. Um, but there was a lot of press. So somebody decided the night before my election to take all of to take some of my more provocative quotes and write them with sidewalk chalk in the middle of Centennial Hall, which was the center of University of Toledo campus, the night before the election, so that folks would be reminded what a racist I was oh. uh, before the election. And, and you know, what's interesting, and, and I love black people, like, I love black people. Steve Hartman, my campaign manager, was not black. And I get a call from Steve, maybe midnight, night before the election. And Steve has been drinking, clearly. <laughs> and he was like, yo, man, it's bad. And I'm like, what? He said, they, they wrote all these quotes in Centennial Mall. Um, I said, all right, I'm on my way. And he said, no, nobody needs to see you here. And he got a bunch of white boys with buckets and brushes and cleaned it all up. And, and, and I've told kids in, in predominantly black leadership training, I said, if I had a black campaign manager, it would have been a different conversation, likely. Mm -hmm. It would have been like, yo, Jeff, we fucked. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I, you know what? Steve Hartman was a groomsman in my wedding, in my Beautiful. first marriage. Um, that, 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 that campaign... And my time as a leader in college taught me what real allyship was about. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't about white people making proclamations about what they wanted to do for black people. It was about well-meaning people creating legitimate relationships with people and serving and building and partnering with them. Yeah. Because you don't have to make proclamations to be an ally. You got to show the fuck up. Absolutely. And... And that's not just about white folks and black folks. That's about if you want to be an ally yeah. to anybody, it's not about the proclamation you make. It's not about the commitment you make. It's not about the check that you write. It's about where do you show up when nobody else is there yeah. to do things that don't benefit you but benefit somebody else. Jeff, you, you value um, service, servitude. Um, in your in yourself, but also in others, where where does that come from? Like I I mean you know and and I say this because it's it's one of the things that one was in your introduction right, yeah that you're a servant yeah um, and you moving from track which is a very in some rights right an individual sport um, to then leading the Black Student Union to then leading um, the entire student body um, and clearly with a mission and a vision to help elevate that organization right in that community and serve we're going to get into all the work that you do now which is definitely about serving others and what you're passionate about but where does that stem from like was that innate in you or does that come from your parents uh, was it instilled from you is, is it church like What's a little bit of that origin story, if you could share? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's a combination of things. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know many people who come from a place where somebody wasn't giving to somebody else. 
Um, and so whether it was the church that I grew up in where I felt served, mm. I, I had a community okay. that provided for me and my family. I lived in a neighborhood where we knew the neighbors and they provided a level of service to each other. Yeah. Nobody, nobody was ever without if somebody else had. And I also am a student. I was also a student of history and, and a student of, and, and not just of movement, right? Not yeah. just of social political movement. Um, I was a student of history and understanding that you can't be a part of a community and not serve. So, so you can't be part of, you can't be a member of a community and be selfish. That's and, a whole word. So, so, so <laughs> wow. I was raised by a community. And so part of my obligation to be a part of that community was to serve it. And because in serving the community, you were serving yourself. Always. You, you, you were feeding a community that was feeding you. Absolutely. And, and so, Keena, I don't know if I've ever even thought about it that way before. I don't even, I don't, I, I don't think I've ever, I've ever even thought about it to that degree. Um, but that's where that came from for me. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what makes you such an incredible leader, though. And, and it's something that we learned at West Point. And, you know, my brother Scott is, is, is here and one of my West Point brothers. But we were taught uh, the style and the skill set of servant leadership. And I think it's funny because I don't think you can be a, a leader <laughs> without serving. No way. Um, huh. Because in order to lead, you have to have a vision that other people believe in and that vision has to then impact others which means that you also are serving those who follow you you have to and if if not even directly your aspiration has to but you're teaching have to that service absolutely if you're truly leading you're feeding. and if you're truly going to accomplish you're feeding it. yep that's service yep and what's, is, and what's interesting, too, is that um, I've always appreciated the game of chess. So Not surprising. I, I recognize <laughs> that there, were, there, there are different pieces okay. on the board. And, and the beauty, too, is that in leadership, you can be different pieces at the same time. And I, I was the national youth director of the NAACP. Wow. <laughs> and um, Reverend Jamal Bryant. Um, who's a, a well-known pastor, um, pastors one of the largest churches in Atlanta. He Absolutely. was the national youth director at the time, and he hired me. And he left the NAACP to open the church, and I was one of the original members. And I was in a meeting in D.C. with a bunch of national leaders that had come from all over the country, and I was like, yo, I got to leave. I got a hard out. And I kept saying I got a hard out. Mm. And somebody said, well, dude, you keep saying you got a hard out. What do you what do you have to leave for? I said, I got to go set up chairs. And they're like, what? Wow. I said, I got to go set up chairs at the church. And and a guy was like, dude, you're the national youth director of the NAACP. We're here for this national meeting. We got people in from all over the country. What are you talking about? I said, yeah, I'm the national youth director for the NAACP, but I'm a member of Empowerment Temple AME Church, and I got to go set up chairs. Wow. And, and I think that there is so often, especially in, in later generations, we've created this, this, this unrealistic mythology around leadership that that says it's about your position and your title and who's kissing your ass versus where do you submit damn because how do you know how to lead 
if you never submit to anything. If you've never followed. And and the and the greatest t- one of the greatest times of my life is remembering when I was carrying bags for somebody else. Damn. Because I got invited into rooms that I didn't work to be in where I wasn't expected to talk. And so the very conversations that I was a beneficiary of were not conversations I deserved to be a part of, but I also was never expected to talk. I only got to learn. And, and, and so those were some of the most powerful moments because now I think about the fact that I can't go into a room without somebody expecting me to say something. And I can't go into a room anymore without someone expecting me, by and large, to contribute to the yeah. strategy or the conversation or, yeah. or whatever it is. And, and the only reason I'm able to do it now is because I was invited into rooms with people that have more wisdom than me where I wasn't expected yeah. to have any conversation, even if I had something to add. Yeah. Nah, bro. Like... It was my turn to be quiet yeah. and learn how things were done and, and how deals were made and, 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 and how wisdom um, provided context and, and how people um, were able to, 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 to look at the room and assess the room and, and, and move the room and, yeah. and, and create impact. And that's as much a part of service, listening learning, submitting, looking for wisdom, and knowing that it's a blessing sometimes when you're not required to provide the answer. That, that's so powerful because I think we all have opinions. <laughs> we have things that we want to share, but I think that was you being actually wise beyond your years early on no 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 it it was it was elders who set a standard because i sometimes wanted to talk Mm. i just knew what was gonna happen if i did well i mean then then you know what i mean so so i I, know they 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 help they help groom yes but i think that's it's it's a challenge right because again right i'm i'm a marketer and i think Everyone, I always say, is a marketer. But really, in a way, everyone has an opinion about things. They don't always fully understand understand context. Yeah. Right, in the full situation. Yeah. And I think you were an extremely smart and gifted young man, right, who had gone through a lot of things. But the rooms that you were in, you didn't still, at that moment, have enough context. And so you had the wherewithal to know that even though I have an opinion and I probably could contribute, I don't have enough understanding of the context. And to me, that is, there's wisdom in that. Even if you were aware of the consequences and there may have been somewhat fear in a way, a lot of folks don't see that because there's so much ego. That's fair. And, and I think for you to exhibit that level of control at, at, at that age with what you had already done, um, is inspiring because so many of us are so gifted early on and we think we have the right yeah right we deserve yeah. to talk but i think it there's wisdom in the fact of understanding that you should listen um and not speak so that when you get to the point where you then talk now your words have so much more impact that's right no that's um, right and 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 so i i think it's that's it's right. extremely commendable but you know look look even now, let, let's fast forward, right? So you, you go through from, from NAACP. Um, yeah. I almost want to steamroll past your time uh, within media, but I can't. Um, <laughs> because I'm, and I want to speed past only because I'm so excited for what you're doing now, but I think context again matters, right? So. Well, so, and it's funny because I didn't want it. Hmm. I, I didn't, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a communications major. I never studied journalism. Okay. I was an activist. Yeah. And many people know Stephen Hill, um, who was the head of entertainment for Black Entertainment, Black Entertainment Television. 
was actively involved in a it's lot getting of rowdy in the hills, y'all. I don't know what's going man, on. Right? <laughs> um, you know, really made the BET Awards what they are yeah. now known to be. And I only really knew Stephen Hill as the dude that got cussed out. Because, like, you know, <laughs> students would come and be like, BT ain't shit. And, yeah. you know, all la 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 la. So I only, I, I was like, that's the dude that gets cussed out yeah. on panels. <laughs> and uh, I left the NAACP and I was literally, I was working for Russell Simmons and the Hip Hop Summit Action Network. And, um, and you know, a lot of us as, as early entrepreneurs, and I was an early entrepreneur because I, I own my consulting firm. I didn't realize until then, I didn't, I didn't understand entrepreneurship. Um, I knew what it meant to have a company. Yeah. I didn't know what entrepreneurship was. Yeah. And so I'm out here with a company and no business. And so. Say, say that again. <laughs> say that, say that again. I, I'm out here with a company and no business. I'm like, I knew what I knew. I didn't know business. And I was wow. so arrogant about what I knew that I didn't, I wasn't honest with myself about not knowing business. So, you know, you learn that shit real quick when you ain't got no clients. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so literally, Keenan, man, I'm out here like, I'm just taking meetings to get somebody to pay for lunch. <laughs> so, <laughs> I might know I'm not going to work for this dude, but I'm taking the meeting because they paying for lunch. Ribs and <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there was a there was a sister who at the time was uh, had left working with Russell to um, work with Puff to run Citizen Change, vote or die. Mm. Um, and uh, she actually is now the head of Planned Parenthood. Wow. Um, so she was like. You should meet with Steven. Your name just came up. Um, and I was like, that sounds like a dude that'll pay for lunch. So I hit Steven. Um, I said, yo, you know, I heard my name came up. He was like, yeah, want to meet with you. Come come by the office. I go by BT offices. And I'm sitting there waiting to have this meeting with him. And I'm looking on the wall. And I see Tigger. And I see AJ and Free. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? So I walk into the, to the office, and, and after a short conversation, Steven says, you know what, man? I love your energy. I think you'd be great for the demo. I want to put you on 106 in Park or Rap City, but I don't know how. Wow. And I'm like, yo. You know, he said, do you want to be on TV? Okay. That's what he said first. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. You know <laughs> I said, all TV ain't good TV. What are you saying? He said, I want to put you on 106 in Park or Rap City, but I don't know how. And I was like, I can't do 106. And he's like, why? I'm like, because, dog, they yelling from the time the show starts to the time the show ends. Like, nobody ever watched 106 in Park, and they're like, hey, welcome to 106 in Park. We're going to – it's yeah. like, yo! Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, nah, bro, that ain't me. Shout out to AJ and Free, though. That yes. Was, I mean, that's the no, they, they killed it, man. <laughs> I mean, but, but you got to know who you are. Absolutely. And Absolutely. 106 was the biggest show on the network. 100%. I still knew that wasn't me. Got it. I said, I can be the Tigger, what Tavis Smiley has been the Tom Joyner. I said, I can come on once a week. I can talk about some shit. I could be out. Steven was like, bet. Wow. You're going to be Tigger's cousin. We're going to call you Cousin Jeff. Yep. We're going to start taping next week. I'm like, nah, Cousin Jeff sound kind of Bama. This shit is already BT. Yeah. I don't know if I'm feeling that. And he was like, trust me. And I, I asked him, I said, will you censor me oh and he said question. no he said no um and he never did wow in seven years of being on rap city and i tried to get censored like i i never forget we were we were going to break once and we had just got done talking about the prison industrial complex and and how brothers weren't getting what they need in prisons and then we were supposed to go to break and I was like, um, so after talking about that, we about to play some dumbass videos coming right back. And at no point did Steven <laughs> say, did Steven say cut? He didn't, he didn't come in and stop it. <laughs> and he, and he let me be me. 
And 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 I know you said you wanted context, but being in the entertainment industry on any level for me was empowering because I was asked to be me. And so many cats when they get into entertainment are actually asked not to be themselves. And so the power and and the encouragement that I had in the industry was was unmeasured because Tigger, Steven, let me be me. And for 13 years, man, I was on, I, I did Rap City, I did the Cousin Jeff, the Jeff Johnson Chronicles, I did the Truth of Jeff Johnson, um, and then ultimately Man Cave. So 13 years. Yeah, you man. Did that. 13 years with BT. Wow. Wow. That I didn't realize it was that that long. Yeah, two, October of 2003 was when I first was on Rap City. Which which that in itself is is incredible. Just the the longevity in that. Um But I think what's so interesting is when we met, I actually have to give the origin story of how we met. Um <laughs> because I think that in itself speaks to both of us in a way uh honestly um so we we were initially connected through live lewis yes who shout out we love to live the, to the warrior goddess live live lewis live is live is incredible um and an amazing spirit right yeah. so i met live i think i was brand manager for tide she was our pr um and we stayed close as our careers grew and evolved. And I had started my agency. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said, you got to meet. I got somebody you got to meet. And she connected us on a text thread. And you were deep. You were, you, you, you are, you were on TV, right? Just life happens. We're rolling. Everybody's busy. And I want to say a couple years pass. Yes. Um, and you were at an event supporting an another amazing sister. Um, Dawn Dixon. Dawn Dixon. Right. At one of her investor summits. Yep. Um, here in L.A. And. And I came. With who just did your podcast. You came with Rich. No. Who? I came with Evie. Oh, that's right. You came <laughs> <laughs> You came with Evie Robinson. You yes, I did. did. That is true. And I'm there, and I came with some guys on, on my team who were investors mm-hmm. in PopCom. Yep. Um, and it was a great, it was a beautiful event. Uh, Don did, did an incredible job um, curating just some great folks. Um uh, and I see you in the corner. You kind of, you know, if y'all don't know, Jeff's a fly dude, man. He, he, <laughs> he's sitting here real cool, you know. But Jeff's fly, man. Uh, Jeff was fly even when he had the dreads, too. Don't think this is smooth. I was flyer, yeah, actually. This, this is the yeah. real smooth, elevated, you know, cigar sip. The, you the know, five smoking. kid. Yeah. The five yeah, the kid, five. Jeff. <laughs> so you sit there. For, and I said, man, I got to go. I'm like. That's Jeff who I was connected with, and we never connected off that text. And what I appreciated, man, is I, I came up, and, you know, it's always somewhat awkward when you come up to folks like that, right, side and scene. But, especially um, in L.A. Yeah, especially <laughs> in L.A., you know. we Everyone wants to have some of the ego and, and, and things, and, man, we dapped up, and we've been cool ever since. From that moment. Like? Like, literally from that moment. Uh, and I think what always struck me about that intro is... You apologized, actually, when there was no need to. You said, man, my bad. We were supposed to connect. And just immediately, that was where your your instinct went. Um, and I thought that was so telling of, about you. And I think now hearing you express yourself from the standpoint of servitude and, and, and just knowing all that you are, there was um, no malice in it. It was, it was purely accidental. Mm. And it almost felt out of character for you. So hmm. I want to use this as a moment to talk about your intentionality with curating relationships. Um, because 
you mentioned Reverend Bryant. Yeah. And I think throughout your life, you have curated relationships. So, again, can you talk about that? Because I feel like what you also do is you gather people, man. I've never seen it. You're like a you're like a real organizer. <laughs> like in a way. Like, um, but on like not just a this this mass scale in these intimate settings. Yeah. As well. Where does that come from? Like and can you talk about that a bit? One one it comes from being an introvert. Huh. Um okay. and so I think that so much of my work has required me to be an extrovert. Okay. Um, but I'm not. Hmm. And so curating intimate circles is safer. Wow. Because I am able to, based on trust, based on mutual interest, based on desired impact, pull people together who I know are of like mind, of like spirit, of like character, um, who want similar things, who I trust, wow. and also who I want to see win. Mm. And, and so I think curation for me is, is, is about those things, but, but it's also about it's safe for me. Um, but it's also it's also connected to my desire um, to create real impact. And so I don't have time to be fucking around with people who yeah. just want to politic. Yeah. Uh, and who want to rah rah each other and, yeah. and who want to blow smoke about who's got the bigger fund or who's got yeah. the bigger job or who's got the bigger this all to the end of nothing. Mm. Um. And so the relationships that I have are, I, I don't believe in transactional relationships. I mean, I, I know that to a degree I have to have them yeah. in business and in life, but the relationships that I invest in are really tribe. And, yeah. and, and again, I told you, I, I came from a community. Yeah. So I want community. I think it's also even bigger than that with you um, because one of the things you've pushed me on and that I will always give you credit for is ensuring that I don't think programmatically and I think in terms of institutions. And so yeah. in order to do that, you have to have this longer term vision and take on things. And I think you treat relationships as part of the institution that you're working on building yeah. in a yeah. way. Yeah. Right, it's and that and that's the impact, though. Right. Yeah. I mean, so 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 the impact for me is is paramount. Yeah. Um, cause I, I've been in too many rooms where. Listen, I, 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 I believe that white supremacy is real. Yeah. Um, I believe that systemic racism is real. Yeah. I also believe that in the midst of white supremacy and systemic racism, we've wasted shit. Hmm. I've seen it. I've seen nonprofit organizations with really brilliant staff who operated out of a level of selfishness for the benefit of themselves and not the benefit of the people that they were created to serve. Ooh. I've watched political leaders leverage power for themselves as opposed to understand that you do realize you would have more fucking power if you were to actually create an opportunity for the people who elected you to create opportunity for them versus save three pennies for yourself. Wow. I've watched, whether it's in the, in the private sector, at the corporate level, executives who had the ability to utilize corporate resources for the creation of black wealth who just wanted to be a platinum employee. So so that shit pisses me off in the face of white supremacy and systemic racism, because God damn it. We don't have that many opportunities anyway, so why waste the ones that we have? And so, you know, I've never been the, 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 the guy who had the, the highest level corporate job and I haven't been the guy who led the largest fund. But I've known them. Yeah. And so if I can play any role 
in being with people and connecting people who are in those places that I've got access to for the benefit of those who don't have access to them for the sake of mutual benefit. Yeah. Like I, I, I don't believe in martyrdom. Yeah. And I also don't believe in altruism. Yeah. I think altruism is a myth of privileged people um, <laughs> to to let them off the hook for giving charity instead of creating impact. Um, I love that. So so that's what that's about for me, Keen. I, 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 I recognize what I am and what I'm not. Yeah. But I also recognize what I have access to. I think one that is that is brilliant. Uh, I think what's also interesting is now you have taken all of that experience and you are focused on creating impact, not just by connecting others, but now you're pouring into your own passion points and what you're driving behind Men Thrive. Yeah. Um, and so you've, you've touched on your passion with you know what you want to see within black men but i i think actually articulate that um so so what it is that you're focused on within black men in the community and the culture and how you are now coalescing that into uh one of your your newest passions right in your new business yeah i mean what's crazy is i'm a black man so I, I got a selfish desire in, in that regard, right? I'm also the father of four sons. Um, so I want my sons to embrace a normal that wasn't the normal for me. Um, but what's crazy is my intentionality around black men was an accident. So I've served the community, and as, as a result, black men have been a part of that. But, but any of us who are in content or in politics know that it's dominated by black women. Yes. Black, black women vote more. Black women consume more, whether that's commercial content or whether that's products. So I don't care where you are within, within corporate nonprofit space, black women are by and large the ones that drive that. And so if you're able to serve black women, if you're able to relate to black women, if you're able to connect with black women, and, and, and I've been able to have, I've had amazing relationships. I mean, Angela Rye uh, and I worked together on the Hill before she was ever on TV. And um, Tamika, I remember meeting Tamika Mallory wow. when she was a local organizer in Sharpton's office when, when I was, when I was with the NAACP. Um, and, and I can name sister after sister after sister who I've been partners with in this work. Yeah. Not them following me, Yeah. partners with them in yeah. that. And so I get that, but but one day, Ayanla Van Zant calls me and she's like, I'm doing this show and the shit just sounded like a fucking nightmare. <laughs> she's like, I, I'm bringing men on that have 10 or more children with multiple women. I think I've seen that. And I need a man's voice to talk to these brothers. And so I'm like, and, 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 and if I, you know, Ayanla has always been good to me. We have always had a good relationship. And I was like, I know how she might destroy this mm. if she doesn't have a man with her who can talk to men because Ayanla will will destroy brothers yeah um all you know with good intentions yeah right but 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 so I said all right I'm, I'm there and so this shit was nuts like so there are about <laughs> five brothers and we got a brother on there who had uh, like 19 kids yeah. with 10 different women and you know seven kids with five different women and 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 I'm immediately convicted because I'm thinking about the terrible husband I was in my first marriage 
Wow. I'm thinking about how I, when I was national youth director, had to had to check myself because I was on my 15th city. And my kids are like, where's daddy at? And I see myself in them. I see myself as a brother who had crazy dysfunctional relationships with women on my own search for for intimacy, abusing relationships with sisters in the name of seeking dysfunctional intimacy for myself. So so I saw myself in them. And I'm like, fuck. Like, I am these dudes. Yeah. And I shared that with them. And on the show, we literally entered into prayer. And there are about 10 men in a circle holding each other, crying, praying, opening up, being transparent in public, let alone on national TV. Yeah, yeah. And at that moment, the next the next day, I launched something called Manhood Legacy Prayer. And for two and a half years, unpublicized, I led a daily prayer call Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. for two and a half years. And, and at our height, we had about five to 700 brothers on the call every morning. And the rule was we would have brothers share. And the rule was, because what brothers will do when you ask them to share is they'll, they'll go into, brothers will reach for the highest aspiration of what men should be. Yeah, yeah. So we gotta, and you gotta. Yeah. Never, I'm dealing with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've overcome. Yeah. I'm struggling with. Yeah. And, and that became the rule on, ma- on Manhood Legacy Prayer. If you want to share... The only way you can share is if you start with, I'm dealing with, I've overcome, I need help with. And for two and a half years, it was a case study in black male intimacy, transparency, struggle, challenge. And that was the gateway for me because it wasn't a program, it wasn't a panel, it wasn't a public discussion, it wasn't a TV show. It was brothers who decided to call in at seven o'clock in the morning, Monday through Friday. Eastern, y'all. To That's talk East, about Eastern time. And we had brothers from all over the world. Like brothers started calling in from Europe, brothers started calling in from from the Caribbean. Um it it was it was one of the most powerful things I'd ever been involved in because it wasn't, it was totally organic. And it was literally for whoever was willing to be a part of it. And that was what led to me brushing off uh, Man Cave and pitching it to BET. That was what led to really having a focus around, around that. And so Men Thrive is a community that is designed to like our our solve is to increase the life expectancy of black men Um, because for those that don't know black men have the lowest life expectancy of any demographic in america Um, we got lower life expectancy than our latinx brothers and sisters we got lower life expectancy obviously than, than than asian and white men with the highest levels of toxic stress highest levels of anxiety highest levels of increased suicide um, <clears throat> highest levels of depression and that's combined with the fact that between white supremacy and antiquated cultural um, um, kind of dysfunctional identity <clears throat> we have created black manhood to mean don't feel wow so I remember my father feeling like he was at war with white people. And so I got to go into this corporate space. And we used to joke like, you know, my, my, my dad was part of that whole 1980s middle management sector, right? That, yeah. that most of the most of the older brothers that are CEOs came up. Absolutely. Through that. Absolutely. But we used to clown them. 
<laughs> so my boys and I, who were who whose dads were in that corporate space, would be like, "Who dad been here longer?" They'd be like, "Well, whose dad got the the least bass left in their voice?" Ooh. Who dad got the least facial hair? Ooh. Because that was real. Absolutely. Like and 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 there were black shaven. men who were diminishing their natural light in the name of ensuring that normally a white male supervisor was not threatened by them. So so you got that. But I'm talking about we can't cry cuz that makes you a bitch. You can't um admit that you're in pain because that makes you weak yeah you can't admit that you're sad because that makes you weak and if that was it keenan that would be bad enough yeah but we won't admit we're happy wow because we might look goofy we can't admit we're excited because we got to act like we've been there before. We can't admit we're in love because it means somebody has control over us. So you're stuck in this stoic, emotionless. Stoic reality of manhood that actually reduces my humanity. So I am at the greatest level of strength when I don't feel shit. This now connects it full circle. For who you are at your essence, which is you're only comfortable when you can bring your full self. As I go back to your story in college. Yeah, and, but we all are. That's you. But we all are. It's, it's, so in your, your drive and what you're delivering for black men, it's the push to get them to embrace their whole self. It, it it is it's it's the push to to do what you do which is at men thrive we're about self mastery and holistic performance yeah and so how do i master the four we in men thrive we have four quadrants of of self mastery mastering my gift yep. and unfortunately again black men men in general if we're going to be fair absolutely but black men in particular their identity is often rooted in vocation. Yep. So what's my job? How much money do I make? Yep. But that ain't your gift. <laughs> so how, you, how many people do you know who have had to do a side hustle because their job didn't give them a space for their gift? Absolutely. So how do you master your gift? How do you master that thing that you do better than almost anybody else without even trying? And how are you able to show up in the world with that as opposed to hiding it? How do you master money, right? And, and mastering money, as you well know, is not about do you know the markets or yeah. do you know how to make money for other people? Mastering your money is how do black men have a relationship with money that is about creating generational wealth? Yes, yes. How do you master your health, mental, physical, emotional? How do you master your manhood? And manhood is relationships. And, and in Men Thrive, we say there are three levels of relationships, which are um, life, love, and legacy. Life is my community, my tribe, you know, my circle. Love is partnership and romance. Legacy is any form of fatherhood. My actual kids, you know, the, the, the kids I show up for because they ain't got no daddy, like yeah. any form of that. How do I master those relationships? And so that's self-mastery. And then the, the, the holistic performance is how do I perform with all of me as opposed to continuing to perform with pieces of me? Because what brothers do is we show up as the piece of me that best represents yeah. the shit I want. But often that's the most damaging because what it does is then I starve all the other shit. Is that where you see toxic masculinity? As I don't a, as believe a term? in that shit. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I, I don't. So, I don't like yeah, it either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but it's a term, right? It, it is. It's, it's not. It's not your it term. Is. It's not my term, right? But it is a term and, that is and, out there. And I didn't mean to say I don't believe in it. Yeah. 
I, I'm I'm frustrated by the application of. Well, I think, and, and why, why I bring it up is because I think the definition of it is so loose and so vague. Yeah. Because we also then don't understand the opposite end of what is healthy than masculinity. Yeah, and but I think what you're, <clears throat> what you're starting to describe, um, and, and, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of, of, of anything negative in that sense, but what I hear you describing is what I was raised of what manhood and masculinity is. Hmm. Um, and what I, I think is interesting is where I take what is toxic to me is anytime you deprive yourself of all of those traits and characteristics and you lean on one, which is this mask, this, this hidden aspect of what you feel is required to survive. Yes. And that's normally what it is, right? I mean, Dunbar wrote, we, I wear the mask. Um, and, and that was about hiding myself in the name of survival. And, and thus, Men Thrive is about thriving, not surviving, yeah, and, and, and disrupting that. But, but, I, but I think you're, you mentioning toxic masculinity is important because yeah. most of the accusations of toxic masculinity come from black women. And toxic masculinity, oh. and, and, and listen, Toxic masculinity is a real thing. The, my, my, my kind of um, uh, aggressive reaction to it yeah. was that I do understand what toxic masculinity is. And, and normally it is, to your point, a reduction of the wholeness of what masculinity is and embracing this single aspect of it, which is in some cases antiquated, in some cases negative, in some cases disconnected. But the challenge that I have with it is we're almost in this season where we are, we are demanding that men acknowledge the aspects of their masculinity that's toxic, but not acknowledge that they were raised by that and are victims of it as much as they perpetuate it. And that's why I bring it up, right? I, I, I brought it up because I feel like um, in the labeling, yep, in the usage of the the phrase, right, in the term of toxic masculinity, we're actually deepening <laughs> the problem and creating more toxicity instead of getting to the solve and what healthy and normal masculinity in manhood is because it's not about running away from it it's actually now learning what your full self is and I think what's so powerful to me about what you do um, in your relationships with, with the folks around you like myself um, and even with your your business now <laughs> yep. um, of, of Men Thrive is you are helping to create impact and solve and starting to define masculinity. Well, and be open to it. Absolutely. B because I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to define masculinity. I, I, and, 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 and I say, I say that- You're giving room for yes. it to exist. Yes, be because I think one of the biggest problems that we're having is everyone is trying to get everyone else to accept their definition of what masculinity yes. is yeah. as opposed to just embracing this spectrum and of mosaic it. of the complexity of masculinity yeah. and allowing brothers to define what it is for themselves in the most healthy way yeah. as opposed to limit pieces of themselves. And, and, and that's important for me because Ooh, I love that. I love that. I saw the horrors of it in my own family. So I actually, I actually come from a family of men who showed up. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think there are any men in my family who bounced. Like, everybody. Like, <laughs> now, we all showed up with our dysfunctions <laughs> and our idiosyncrasies, right? But, but, Trip to college. But every, every uncle I have is raising kids. And, yeah. My grandfather, but my grandfather committed suicide when I was seven. Wow. 
I didn't know he committed suicide until I was in my early 30s. So my grandfather went blind. Um, and my grandfather, all, of my, all the Johnsons are from Columbus, Georgia. And, okay. um, Johnny B. Johnson Sr., my grandfather, moved to Cleveland, Ohio um, when the Ford plants opened with, yep. with so many other people. They were part of that second great migration. And um, went to work every day, brought the check home every other week, was at dinner every night, mm -hmm. and went blind. And so his job was his identity. And here's what's crazy, right? Because it was forward. So he had long-term disability, pension. The family was straight. He didn't feel like a man. And it wasn't no emotional intelligence. Wow. At that to 19, what was it, 19, I was seven years old, 1980. Wasn't no emotional intelligence. And, and my grandmother didn't know how to have conversation with him about how he was feeling. His children didn't know how to have conversation about how he was feeling. He felt useless. Damn. And Damn. he took his life. And, and what's profound about that, Keenan, is that not only, I was seven. So I, I don't expect that anybody's gonna tell me my grandfather committed suicide when I was seven. Nobody ever told me. I was having a conversation with my mother's stepfather and he mentioned it to me like I was supposed to know. <laughs> and I didn't. Come to find out none of my cousins knew. Wow. As, as late as a year ago. And so clearly there was an issue in the family yeah. about either shame or didn't know how to talk about it or just wanted to forget about it. Yeah. But Keenan, my father, when he was in his early 50s, started going blind. Coupled with seven years of fourth stage cancer. And I watched my father, by that time I knew what had happened with my grandfather. And I'm so glad I did because it enabled me to appreciate my father's decision to live. Wow. And to thrive. And for him not to embrace this condition and not to succumb to cancer. And, and he, he, my father lived with my wife and I the last two years. I learned what life was. I learned what thriving was. Watching my father, man, this dude was nuts. Like, like <laughs> I, 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 had a, I had an event and met, um, what's, what's, what's the brother's name uh, who was the governor of New York, the brother who's blind? Oh. Um, uh, Patterson. Yeah. Governor Patterson. So I was at an event with Governor Patterson, and, and, I, and I happened to mention him. My dad is legally blind, and you know we had some short conversation, and I told my dad I met Governor Patterson and blah, blah, blah. So maybe a month later, my dad says to me, Jeff, who's living in Arizona, legally blind at the time, um, I want to get on the governor of Arizona's commission for the blind and the visually impaired. So can you call the governor of New York? and ask him to get me on this commission. Wow. I'm like, Dad, we're not friends. <laughs> I just met him. Yeah. He's like, yeah, but y'all talk. So call him. Work it out. So I'm like, this dude is nuts. <laughs> I said, so I'm going to tell him I called him and, you know, say he didn't get back with me. And then I'm sitting there like, I can't do that. No. So let me call the governor's office, cold call. <laughs> And I said, hey, this is Jeff Johnson. I'm from BT, you know, because that's always going to, you know, it's always, it's, it yeah. rolls off the tongue. Absolutely. Right? And, um, you know, I met Governor Patterson and we talked about my dad who's blind and the governor asked me to give him a call. Um, so, you know, let him know. 30 minutes later, Governor Patterson calls me back. Wow. And I'm like, Governor Patterson, how you doing? Jeff, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, I mentioned my dad to you. He said, I remember, you know, 
So, you know, long story not so long, I tell him what my dad is interested in doing. Three hours later, same day, three hours later, I get a call from the governor's office in Arizona who says, can I speak to Jeff Johnson? I said, this is he. He's, she says, my name is so-and-so, and I just have to be honest with you, I'm confused. And I'm like, well, how can I help you? She said, well, I don't understand why the governor's office in New York keeps calling us about somebody named John Johnson. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. He didn't believe in limits. And so in one generation, to go from a man who committed suicide because he didn't know how to talk about his issues, because he didn't know how to handle his issues, because he, cause, cause he, he didn't know those things were possible, to my father, who was able to look those things in the eye, to say, to say that I'm going to live, I'm going to thrive in the face of these. And, and simultaneously, this was, a, this was a father who hugged me, who kissed me, who, who was, was affectionate with me, in ways that my grandfather didn't know how to be with him. I didn't know where my father learned this. And so men thrive in a lot of ways is a, is a, is a testimony and a tribute to the men in my own family who didn't know how, who only knew how to survive. And in one generation created a blueprint for thriving. Man, the context. Um, I'm I'm actually at at a bit of a loss for words, and I, I almost want to do what you did in the moment when I'm sitting in the face of of greatness. Shut up. Um, unfortunately for me, I'm sitting across from you, and 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 I have to talk. Um, but it takes me to a moment where this was right before the pandemic, I believe. And we were at a cigar lounge with my dad. <laughs> and my dad, similarly to your grandfather, didn't have all the tools mm. um, and wasn't taught in ways to express himself around what he was feeling and was very much in survival mode. Mm. And in one conversation, and I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but I think you saw it real time, where my dad and I were having deeper level conversations mm. around things that were had troubled him yep. and had impacted how he started to move. And I think that was, for me, men thrive on a a micro level yeah right and in something in a one-on-one -on -one capacity with you know the three of us over a cigar that my dad wouldn't smoke because he stopped <laughs> smoking uh, <laughs> but 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 an amazing drink where i got it i yeah. got what it was that you were doing and i think you know, for me, right, being being open and honest, right, and, and we've talked about this, I myself didn't understand mental health and therapy and some of these things because I viewed it as a weakness yep. and a crutch. And what you've helped me understand is that it is a tool and it's actually what gives you strength. Without question. Um and it's a performance enhancement. Yes. And to hear you talk about through generations and now seeing the man that's in front of me and how incredibly strong I see you to be and how strong you are, it's, it's even more elevated hearing the context and what can happen in generations. Without question. And and how you as a as a Johnson, how you guys are continuously building. Mm -hmm. And you know, I won't go into detail, but watching you as a father and the conversations 
I've seen you have with your kids. Hmm. I'm so excited to see their elevation of even where you are and how it continues to go. And that's the point, right? And that is I mean, the point. That, that's and that, the and that's, that's what Jernacy is about. And, and you know, Jernacy is, is, is my other company. And Jernacy was created because I, as a black dad of, of 22 years, 20 years at the time, I'm like, I don't remember a product being made specifically for black dads. And no, I know, I know we got organizations that got merch and it's t-shirts and all that kind of stuff, but, but is there a product made for black dads? Is there a community for black dads? And I'm like, I don't know one. And, and, and I, I knew of, I knew of guys that I think are doing amazing work, Absolutely. whether it's the dad gang or fatherhood fraternity, Absolutely. a number of organizations. Um, so shout out to those brothers who, who are doing that. But I was looking for something that was existing on a different level. And, yeah. and so Jernacy is Jernacy and legacy. It's it's the celebration of the unique journey every black dad is on to create legacy for his children. Mm. And 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 that was the point of it. And, and, and similar to the story that I told you, I'm like, I, I remember I remember asking my dad, I'm like, Dad, did you and grandpa ever talk the way you and I talk? And he was like, Jeff, I go out to the garage and I sit there and I wait for your grandfather to ask me to pass him a tool. And that was our conversation. And so when I think about all the things my dad, similar to, to, to what you just mentioned in a lot of ways, when I think about all the things my dad wasn't, I have tremendous grace. Cause I'm like, dude, this dude was revolutionary. Yeah, He was revolutionarily more to me yeah. than his father knew how to be to him. Yeah. And so when you you sit at dinner with me and my daughter as we go through for 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 those that are listening like the kind of conversation that you don't actually want anybody else to be at <laughs> like and, and my daughter is is expressing challenges that she's had with me uh, trauma that she believes is connected to me challenges as 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 she's thinking about her own trajectory in a really authentic and beautiful way. So beautiful. My father wouldn't have been able to have that conversation with me. Um, and would have shut that shit down before it ever happened in public. Yeah. But Madison needed to have that conversation with me in that moment. And I actually think she felt safer with you there. You know, and I, I have to thank her as much as I thank you because I grew so much by observing <laughs> that conversation. Mm -hmm. Similar to you being in the room with some of those folks that you were in in your earlier career, I had nothing to say. I may have had an opinion. But that was a night, man. But that was a, a great moment, and I am thankful that I was there, and I'm even more thankful that I was there and I was quiet. <laughs> No, that was a night. Because that was a night. You guys both helped me grow, mm. um, and I don't think I was able to articulate that properly at the end of the night when we were wrapping up. But I want to 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 give you both your your flowers now. So Madison, these flowers are also for you, uh, ma'am. Um, and you, man, you you guys helped me evolve and and grow, and especially as I think about this journey that I'm on. Mm -hmm. And and now being a new dad, I think you guys made me a better father mm. in that moment before you even realized that I was about to be a father. <laughs> so and, and that's uh, the thing, thank you right? for that. Be because where is that for us? And 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 at Jernacy, we were just having a conversation the other day. Uh, a guy was asking me about the community, and I'm like, listen, stop asking brothers what they do, <laughs> because. That's not what this community is about. Yeah. There's equity in fatherhood. Like, so it doesn't matter what your job is, how much money you make. Because I don't have shit to do. With you. You, you and I both know men who got millions in the bank and incredible jobs and their kids don't know where they are. Yeah. And on the flip side, we know brothers don't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of and their kids are healthy. 
because daddy is there. Yeah. And and so fatherhood isn't about those things. So so in the Jersey community, we don't ask what you do. Um, you, we had that conversation, but yeah. that, that's not what it's about. It, it, it's about two things. Dads know two things. What they know how to do well and what they don't know. <laughs> and that's what the community is about. Yeah. How do we give you space for you to be able to share what you do well and learn what you don't? Wow. And, and if we can create a community where brothers feel safe enough to say, I talked to a brother the other day and he was like, Jeff, he was like, I think I'm getting ready to mess this up because I was, I, my father never changed the diaper. Wow. And so I was always taught that that's the shit she does. And these are simple things, right? Yeah. And I'm like, bruh, like, what are you actually confused about right now? <laughs> Cause I don't think you're as confused as you think. Yeah. And, and he's like, his anxiety was actually around not doing it right not not doing it yeah and so where do we as men give ourselves permission i think i think one of the things that i said to you when we were on we were on our brotherhood call is plan to fail yeah yeah like and and as dads if we can be in a community where we can feel comfortable failing because we tried yeah then it just makes us better dads. And, and that's why I'm excited about the Jersey community. And, and I don't even think I said we, we created a dad bag. Um, <laughs> Cause really it's the community for me, right? We, we, we created a, what I think is a beautiful bag that that's dedicated to black fathers. That, that is, that is this, this tool for you to be on this journey, but the community is what makes it is what makes it real. And, and, and so Keenan, if, if whether it's men thrive and, and behavioral health and, and 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 creating these disruptors to to toxic anxiety and stress and helping to create communities of accountability or whether it's journey where where we're elevating and celebrating and serving dads Matt, imagine what the world looks like if black men show up whole i i think it's just it's it's a beautiful construct in in both entities that you have and have built because they're both around growth and and that's what life is about that's what business is about um is embracing and enjoying the process of growing yeah um and and there's so much humility and so much strength uh, and just beauty in in that and so one thank you thank you for for sharing the journey and how you you got to these points in these two amazing companies uh and now i have to just ask what is next where where are you taking it yeah i mean and and you you know that um covid created some interesting realities um Absolutely. you know a, attempting to grow company in covid was awesome and terrifying and yeah um but created great case study for us to learn and so we're scaling both companies um i don't know what in the hell i was thinking by doing both at the same time <laughs> um but but journey is really a product company yeah. um that creates community around serving black dads and and men thrive as a service company um in in which we're yeah. creating content and coaching and community uh, to do these things so so what's next is making them work and and growing and scaling them and so um i've been building team uh been getting myself out of the way yeah uh, you know something about that <laughs> and um and and really being excited about what i don't know yeah um so that that can help drive um the development of what I believe are going to be two of the most powerful communities of black men that we have. And not because of me, because of the communities themselves. Wow. I mean, you, you've given us so much, you've given me so much personally, um, but I'm going to be selfish and ask you to give a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, 
what 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 do you want to leave us with in this conversation right um this podcast is about self-mastery venture noir is about you know our our journey of of building healthy businesses Mm -hmm. um creating long-lasting impact um ending some of these racial inequities right and some of these historic and systemic things that have have plagued the nation um but i think in your your own personal journey outside of just the business what are some of the lessons that you want to leave us with because you know that's the thing man i got to give you the last word this is this is your show um so i'll be real honest I did the podcast because you asked me to. (laughs) I didn't believe I deserved to be on it. Wow. Because when I think about brothers who I know that are running amazing businesses, mine aren't there yet. And I'm upset with myself for feeling that way. Wow. Because I know I'm dope. But damn if that imposter syndrome don't be fucking with me, dog. (laughs) 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 It be fucking with me. And and so I think I think it's important for me to acknowledge that. Yeah. Because. I know a, a lot of brothers who are listening to this who don't think they deserve the spaces that have already been carved out for them to insert their brilliance. Wow. And they've committed to self-mastery, but they just haven't seen the manifestation enough yet for them to feel confident about their own contribution. Yeah. And so I'm thankful for the invitation because it's a reminder of my own brilliance. And so one, I'm hoping that brothers who keep questioning and sisters for that matter, who keep questioning because in this social media driven ecosystem that we're in, we're so often comparing ourselves to what other people have raised and what other people have sold and what other people have developed and what other people have advanced and, and that's bullshit. Facts. Because none of us have anybody else's call. It's yours. And yeah. so I was literally, with all that I know and with all that I've seen, comparing myself to other people and assessing my value of being on a podcast with my boy. And that speaks to some of the shit that we're all having to dismantle in pushing ourselves to know how to make the right ask. Because so many of the folks that 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 are either guests on your podcast or, or listening to it have made the wrong ask because we've devalued ourselves before we ever got to the to the negotiating table. Yeah. And so fuck that. Like for real. Yeah. I'm speaking to myself in yeah. this moment as I'm speaking to so many of those who are listening, because because some of us have endless confidence and some of us are overcompensating because we 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 have the gift, we have the vision, we have the work ethic, we, we have the education, we have all this other shit. But 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 trauma has literally said, I still don't know if I deserve it. Yeah. And so if there's anything I can leave, it is that you do. And I do, too. Yes, you do. Man, Jeff, <laughs> thank you for one sharing that bit of honesty, and that's why I was so humbled and and and, and I'm so thankful and grateful that you would come on this <laughs> and, and have these conversations that that I've been so privileged enough to have with you offline and to bring this to the public, and and I just want to say, man, that you're amazing. Um, that I look up to you in so many ways and you're just incredibly brilliant and thoughtful um, and in your passion 
is in your love hmm. of of those of of me across from you right now uh, for those that you interact with on a daily basis and and really your love for the folks that are listening that you haven't met hmm. that you have an an unbelievable amount of love for um, and I think your truth and what you're sharing is why you're so great and that is what this whole series is about uh, there's so much more that you're gonna achieve and there's so much that you've already achieved and again that all doesn't really matter <laughs> <laughs> it's actually about what all that you continuously learn yeah and how you are continuously growing and that's what to me defines healthy businesses and healthy people is the fact that they have to continuously grow, learn and evolve. And thank you for sharing your evolution. And, and honestly, I'm privileged right now because I get to have a front row seat in your journey. Um, and, and I yours, man. And, and I'm thankful. So I'm thankful. Um, with that, <laughs> Please, yeah. go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was just going. I just want to say. I just want to publicly say thank you, because um, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I think. I think about the. I think about that meeting at that event for Don Dixon, <laughs> and the conversations and the musings and the sparring and the sharing, and the deal making and the connectivity yeah. that we've had. Um, and even as I think about our, our, our small group of brothers that, that, that talk, um, man, I learn so much from you every time we have a conversation. And so I'm, I'm thankful. I'm better for that. Um, and I don't know if we'd say that enough publicly to each other. You know what I'm saying? Because, yeah, um, yeah. yo, this podcast is dope as fuck. Like, this fire <laughs> shit, bro, is just like on some other level. Shout like, out to Luigi. Motherfuckers don't be doing fire podcasts, no, bro. No, uh, not on purpose. <laughs> the, the studio might be on fire, but 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 but, but, it, but it's so you though. Yeah. Um. And so I'm 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 thankful, brother. Well, thank you. Um. Man, with that, we done broed out. Um. We done had yeah. great wine, like, great bro. steak. Um. Yeah. Like, comment subscribe all that y'all um but you know most importantly man continue to follow jeff um and in the work that you're doing and and jeff i'm gonna ask you selfishly to continue to share um so that you can help all of us grow and, Absolutely. and continue to get better um and get from survival to thriving and so thank you for that and the work that you're pouring into the community thank you for coming um but damn y'all it's another episode of world's greatest game Jeff Johnson. Appreciate you, bro. My man.